Um, I want to introduce you to Professor Hund. She is a professor of sociology here at Long Beach City College. And she's going to be giving us a short presentation about social movements um, before we get started with our panelists. So please give up a hand for Ms. Hund. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. I think we have at least four classes that are uh, participating in this democracy exercise today. So again, the topic for today's event is resistance, social movements. And before we get to our panelists, I uh, would like to actually, before we even go to my next slide, I would like to see if uh, Anyone would like to share what, briefly, 30 seconds or less, what you would like to hear or to receive from today's discussion on resistance social movements? Any brave souls out there? What would you like to hear? What would you like to be discussed? This was a request from one of our panelists that we find out from you. Yes. You can come to the mic real quick if you like. Great. Anyone else? Great. All right, thank you. So again, uh, please sign in if you're a student at, on campus. Uh, sign in on one of the sheets as you enter in the door. Um, I also want to say thank you to student equity funds that actually provided the lunch for us all here today. Uh, student equity is basically, yes, thank you. Student equity is dedicated to eliminating achievement gaps at Long Beach City College and uh, encouraging the institution to give everything uh, that students need to be successful in their courses and in their degree and certificate completion at Long Beach City College. And I also want to say thank you to the Social Sciences Division, which has sponsored uh, the We the People series. This is the first event for this spring. We will be having a second event, I believe, on May 8th. And uh, that topic, I believe, will sort of continue with this one. It's going to focus, I believe, on the blowouts or walkouts from 1968 in the local LA high schools and also in music and art flair to that one. So again, thanks also to my co-instructor, uh, Professor Estrada, for agreeing to uh, allow us to bring our class to be a part of this discussion today. So, thank you so much. Uh, I have some quiz questions for you as we get started. And I have two prizes in my pocket. Really, really simple prizes. So, this is a litmus test, I guess, about how honest you are. So, number one, fill in the blank. Was a Shawnee chief who resisted against British colonialism in the eastern U.S. aiming to create a pan-Indian movement against the encroach, encroaching Anglo Euro-Americans. Tecumseh is the correct answer. Maybe somebody else had the correct answer too, okay? So we've got five. If you get all five, you get one of the beautiful prizes here in my hand. Uh, number two, journalist, fill in the blank. This journalist led the anti-lynching campaign in the late 1800s through early 1900s, influencing public opinion and awareness of often state-sanctioned killings of African Americans. I see a hand back there, and she's going for two for two. So what do you got? Ah, OK, C, Ida B. Wells. All right. And then number three, 
Southern legislators, such as this Alabama governor, resisted the enforcement of Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. By the way, Linda Brown just passed away. Uh, in 1954 by declaring segregation now, segregation forever. D. George Wallace, correct answer. Is that what you were gonna say? Probably, right, okay. <laughs> Number four, uh, the first walkouts in East LA high schools occurred in what year? I believe I just told you that. To resist an English only curriculum, lack of Latin X teachers and a Eurocentric curriculum. C, 1968. Last question, fill in the blank. Resisted Hitler's Third Reich in Germany by writing and leafleting a document that challenged the fascist German government, acknowledging that every honest German is ashamed of their government. She knows, what is it? Oh, it is not D. A, it is the White Rose Society. Anybody like feel like you uh, won, got close to, did you get them all right? Okay, we're just, come get it. The pin says, building unity with you. You got at least four out of five and you were, you know, vocal. Do you want the other pin? Same thing. Anybody want a pin? Building unity with you. Okay, come grab it. Who, first come, first serve. Yeah, there we go. Great. All right. So, I'm a sociologist. I want to give us a little sociological foundation before we hear from our panelists today. And so, kind of a long quote from this guy named C. Wright Mills. Any sociology students out there, have you heard that name before? C. Wright Mills? Okay. Yeah, men or women. In his time period, he wasn't thinking about women, but anyway. Uh, they do not usually define the troubles they endure in terms of historical change and institutional contradiction. The well-being they enjoy, they do not usually impute to the big ups and downs of the societies in which they live. Seldom aware of the intricate connection between the pattern of their own lives and the course of world history, ordinary men and women do not usually know what this connection means for the kinds of people they are becoming and for the kinds of history making in which they might take part. T. Wright Mill said, they do not possess the quality of mind essential to grasp the interplay of man and society, of biography and history, of self and world. Part of the reason of doing this presentation is to help you all, you know, kind of focus a little bit on the historical time period that we're sharing together and how that is shaping the course of not only U.S. history, world history, but your history, right? Connecting you to the period we're, living, we're all living in. So defining social movements, right? So James Henslin, sociologist, defines social movement as a large number of people organized to promote or resist social change or the existing social order. We are gathered here today to talk more about resistant social movements, but in the context, we probably need to realize that for every resistant social movement, there's probably a, a counter movement that's organizing against the resistance or you know, against the interest of the resistors. So resistance uh, social movements can be understood as reactive. They're reacting to some condition of society that is changing. So think about like what are resistance movements today? What are they reacting to, right? What kind of change are groups reacting to today? Stephen Barkin, another sociologist, defines that resistance social movements seek to prevent or undo change to the social structure. Everything about social movements is about bringing on change or resisting that change to come. <clears throat> so a little more depth from sociology. So one of the key concepts that sociologists might convey is the distinction between individual agency, that's like our personal abilities, our personal choices, versus the larger social structure that we find ourselves living in. So as individuals, 
We are limited in our ability to make societal changes that we would like. There are massive social forces that make change difficult. Would any of you agree with that? We might want things to change, but there are bigger things out there that keep us from achieving the change we would like to see, right? So these social forces include things like government, powerful organizations. What are other powerful organizations that might prevent the change from happening that you would want to see? Throw it out there. The NRA. The NRA. Lobbyists, I heard. Koch brothers. Corporations. What? PACs and super PACs, lobbyists, mm -hmm. a lot of political economic answers there, just along the lines of C. Wright Mills. All right, so as individuals pro protesting to officials, we have minimal power. But if we combine with others who share our convictions, we organize ourselves, and we map out a course of action, we just may be able to bring about the changes that we're looking for. Through participation in a social movement, we can break through the social constraints that might overwhelm us as individuals. So I want to give an example here of two social movements uh, today that, uh, you know, at first glance you might not see that there's a connection between these two. One is Black Lives Matter and the other one is 350.org. Have you heard of, how many of you have heard of Black Lives Matter? Okay, how many of you have heard of 350.org? Fewer of you, right? So we've got a brand new club at Long Beach City College uh, dedicated to this, and it's an environmental-based club um, that's really pursuing environmental justice, uh, but very specifically uh, um, divestment in fossil fuels. So here we got Black Lives Matter, 350.org. You might look at those two and say, what on earth do those two things have to do with each other? Did it go away? It did. Okay. All righty. So the best of plans. Apparently it was clicked out. So I probably did that. Let's try this again. Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm going to show you. Well, of course that means you too, Maddie. Let me show you guys how I did it. Okay, so what I'm about to play for you is a video that was streamed here at Long Beach City College in January, um, put on by 350.org, and uh, well-known people like Bernie Sanders, Bill McKibben, and then Reverend Lennox uh, were part of this, and it was an amazing presentation about all these individuals trying to make change, but collectively, sort of under the lens of 350.org. And so I just want to play a short clip of Reverend Lennox reminding us about connections between social movement organizations. And Bill McKibben of 350.org. Thank you all very much. You tell them. You tell them. You can do better than that. Let's make some noise for Senator Bernie Sanders. <laughs> so, before we get started, um, let, let me say this as you can see from my hat, I actually want to uh, start uh, by giving honor to, one, all of the amazing climate activists, like Bertha Caceres, who gave their lives for this movement, and for an amazing 
Um, equity, freedom fighter, warrior, my friend Erica Garner. And those things, those things are connected. For those who are watching who may not know that Erica Garner's father was, was killed um, by the New York Police Department in an illegal chokehold, I mean, you saw him, his last words were, I, I can't breathe. And Erica sprung up. Um, what's the connection with the climate, though, is that even if he hadn't been choked, regarding the pollution and his borough had an F for air quality, is that Eric Garner and all his children had asthma. And so even for him, and then when Erica died, she had an asthma attack, which then created a heart attack, which put her in a coma, and when she died at 27, just one month ago. Um, so I want to lead off with that, because these things are connected. And so with that, you know, I just want to thank all of the Right, so Reverend Lennox is challenging us, right, to start to see the connections between social movements that we might not see until we're assisted in seeing. So as we get ready for our panelists here today, I want you to try to see if you can make connections between each of the movements that they, they also represent. Okay, so some history, uh, brief history references. So I said earlier that anytime you're going to see a, a resistance social movement, you probably have another social movement on the opposite side of the continuum that's pushing for the opposite type of change or that's resisting whatever the other group wants. Just some examples of uh, resistance movements, right? So the anti-lynching campaign led by, what was that journalist's name? Ida B. Wells, right? So she led a resistance movement, started with herself, and then it developed into a larger uh, media uh, movement against basically the KKK and the vigilante groups of that time. The White Rose Society, who were they resisting against? Hitler's Third Reich. Uh, the anti-apartheid uh, movement started in the 60s and went all the way to, what, 1993, I think? Who were they resisting? Where was apartheid being practiced? South Africa, right? So Nelson Mandela spent many years of his adult life in prison, right? But they were kind of resisting. And there's a message there. Sometimes resistance movements take a really long time to get the change that they're looking for. The anti-Vietnam War protest took place on college campuses uh, last century, uh, you know, opposing the U.S. involvement in the war. Uh, Chicano moratorium, kind of uh, picking up on that. Uh, also, Chicano activists who were opposed to Chicano's involvement in Vietnam War. Those are sort of on the political left spectrum, but then you can also identify political right resistance movements, right? So the KKK, established in 1866, right after slavery was abolished. Uh, what were they resisting? The end of slavery, right? Wanted to go back to business as usual. The anti-choice movement kicked off uh, large scale in 1973. What were they resisting? Abortion rights, which was that Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade. Uh, the Minutemen Militia. A vigilante group at the border, particularly states like Arizona, Texas, California. What were they resisting? Immigration, right? Kind of somewhat porous border, uh, southern border. Anti-marriage equality activists uh, took their movement in 2007. What were they uh, rallying against? Is that proposition in California? Prop 8, right? So resisting against Prop 8. Uh, the Tea Party kicked off on a national scale in 2009. What were they resisting? And more specifically, they were resisting Obama and any of his efforts, right? But they guised it as uh, the federal spending. Right, so how might we use any sociological theories to sort of 
think about movements on the left or on the right, or even making connections between movements. One theory is called frame alignment process, and it's an ongoing and intentional means of recruiting people into a movement, which relies on how the movement is framed, how it's presented to others, the language used in framing. You think framing happens around us in the year 2018? Movements might be framed positively or negative and it might inspire our participation or lack thereof. So four potential stages of a framing alignment process. Bridging, it brings uninvolved people or ineffective groups together and it encourages a larger movement. And there, that might lead to amplification. You expand ideas to even a wider audience, which further enlarges the movement. Again, extending the efforts. Sympathetic movements support each other, which grows the strength of movements. Ultimately, the frame and alignment process suggests that we transform a society, right? We have a complete revision of goals once a movement has achieved its goals, right? So like you like have to you know, go bigger than that or you know, go a different direction if the framing has been successful in promoting change. Uh, just quick, uh, any ideas uh, what groups or individuals or mediums might uh, frame social movements today? Right. Okay. Exactly. And so who's, who's involved in framing these movements? To help them grow or perhaps to squash them? What forms of media? All forms of media. You could say corporate media, independent media, social media. Did I see another hand over here? Mm -hmm. Right, special, in, special interest groups frame their issues in the way that they want the public to see them, right? So you might see competing special interest groups compete their move, or frame their movements very differently. Another theory to get us thinking um, is intersectionality. So a couple of sociologists, Margaret Anderson and Patricia Hill Collins set the stage for intersectionality that Kimberly Crenshaw and others have built upon. So they're just reminding us that, you know, sometimes there are groups of people, individuals in groups, that might be obscured from our view, right, that we don't get to hear from, right? And disproportionately, they argue that, that poor people are in that group. Women might be in that group. People of color might be in that group, right? And so, you know, how, how, how then are we understanding their experiences, right? If their experiences haven't been framed for us. Um, and sh they argue that often how we see these groups might be in a distorted way from somebody else's efforts at framing. They remind us that race, class, and gender impact all of our lives, sometimes more obvious than others. And they urge us to develop a more inclusive framework. Right? We include more people at the table um, by asking that question, how might the world look differently if we put their experiences front and center? Take them from the margins and put them front and center, that that becomes what we're looking at, right? That's not an afterthought. George Takai, you might know his voice from, what was it, Star Trek, <laughs> right? So, an activist, so an activist uh, in the current resistance, but he has allegiances to the uh, Asian American and LGBTQ communities. He says he's been born witness to some of the most egregious injustices and tragedies of our national history. Do you know what he's talking about there? 
His parents were interned, I believe, during World War II, right? Japanese Americans. Where both the public and the politicians turned against us to devastating effect. And then fast forwarding, this is a quote after the 2016 election from Takai. He says, in today's political environment, we find ourselves again outsiders, forming a core of those opposed to the powers in Washington and in many of our state capitals. It is axiomatic that little worth fighting for has ever come without a fight. We truly have grown stronger together, and with each new assault upon our dignity and humanity, we will grow stronger. So welcome to the resistance, he says. It's where the next heroes of our movement will emerge. Be ready, be vigilant, and be strong. LA Times, about one year ago, uh, did a series on uh, the dishonest president. And they posed the question, will the system, they define the system as the courts, the Constitution, Congress, Democrats, Will the system and the marchers in the streets protect us from him being specifically President Trump? If our rule of thumb is to sustain itself, those who oppose the new president's reckless and heartless agenda must exercise their voices. Protesters, voters, Congress, Democrats, Republicans, they must find the courage to stand up to Trump. And I think we have a really recent example of people standing up, very young people standing up, um, and challenging the status quo. I, I don't know that I would call them a resistance social movement, as they're more of a proactive movement. And then we see the resistance would be the NRA and the politicians that want to keep doing business the way they've been doing it, and these students are pushing them for change. I have a short clip. Soros-funded Never Again movement took their childish message of living to adulthood to D.C. The turnout for the March for Our Lives rally was sure to be as small. We've had enough of the lies, the sanctimony, the hatred. We've had enough of the lies, the sanctimony, the hatred, the pettiness, the arrogance, the ignorance, the fake news, the NRA. We are done with your agenda to undermine voters' will and individual liberty in America. We are done with your agenda to undermine the safety of our nation's youth and the individual voices of the American people. So to every line member of the media, to everyone with an A-plus rating from the National Rifle Association, to the role model athletes who use their free speech to alter and undermine what our flag represents, to every spokeswoman with an hourglass who uses their free speech to alter and undermine what our flag represents, to the politicians who would rather watch America burn than lose one ounce of their own personal power, to the politicians who would rather watch America's youth die than get assault rifles off shelves, to those who stain honest reporting with partisanship. To those who call high school students paid crisis actors and refuse to listen. Your time is running out. Your time is running out. The clock starts now. The clock starts now. So we see a, a, a visual here of movements, opposing movements in, in action. I do encourage you, if you haven't been able to look at any footage. There's beautiful footage online covering a four hour, uh, there's a four hour coverage on Democracy Now! You can find it online and see for yourself what these young people had to say and why they are marching for their lives. So I'm gonna shift here to uh, our moderator and our panel discussion. I wanted to give you a framework just to think about as you consider the questions and their answers. And I'm going to ask the uh, panelists if you can come to the front, please. And I'm going to introduce to you uh, Clara Ure. Uh, she is a Long Beach City College student. Uh, she is a founder of the Feminist Club at Long Beach City College, and she is trying to transfer in June. She's definitely transferring. She doesn't know where yet. And she's also an honor student and amazing Long Beach City College student. So she's going to take over from here and introduce our panelists and questions. Thank you. Clara. Uh, 
Uh, so speaking of standing up, can I just one more time have anyone that has an empty seat next to them move towards the center to make room for all of these students that are standing in the back, please? And we have a whole open row up here as well. So six of you that want to come up, go ahead. Now, before we begin, please. Thank you. And yes, there's three seats up here. There's three up here. So come on, come on over, please. There's plenty of seats. Okay. So we have Jonathan Solorzano. Can you wave your hand? Jonathan Solorzano is the community organizer for the Long Beach Immigrant Rights Coalition and a lifelong resident of Long Beach, as well as an alumni of LBCC. His work focuses on the well-being of the immigrant communities of Long Beach and the rest of the South Bay, and he does this by organizing and advocating for them at the local, statewide, and federal level. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> Yosh Yamanaka. Yoshi Yamanaka is presently the chair of Our Revolution Long Beach. He has been an activist since marching against the Vietnam War and has served on numerous nonprofit boards, including Captive Daughters, Los Angeles Friends of Tibet, the KPFK Local Station Board, and Board of Pacifica Foundation. Welcome, Yosh. Thank you. I'm going to skip over you real quick. <laughs> um, Estefania Rebellon uh, is an actress, activist, and author of the Women's March book, Our Story. She was the MC for the hashtag MeTooMarch in Hollywood and performed the sound effect, a poem, The Sound Effects, at this year's Women March in Los Angeles. She got involved with activism as a water protector at the Standing Rock campgrounds. Welcome, Estefania. Evelyn Knight is a native of Africatown, Alabama. Evelyn Knight was brought to Long Beach in 1962 by Catholic Social Services to open up more community, more opportunity, sorry, for the African American community. A founder of the Long Beach Community Improvement League, Evelyn was called back to Selma, Alabama in 1965 to march with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to protest Bloody Sunday and a push for the National Voting Rights Act. Welcome, Evelyn. Tariq Mohammed is a founder and imam for the Long Beach Islamic Center, now located in Signal Hill. Welcome, Tariq. And Lupe Lopez is currently a paralegal and is very much involved in her community in the areas of Native issues. Lupe is an organizer and an advocate for change in bringing Native existence in Orange County. Welcome, Lupe. And we're gonna go back to you, Jedi. Jedi Jimenez is a hip hop artist, youth organizer, and cherry person of Anak Bayan, Long Beach, a youth and student organization that fights for the rights of Filipino youth here in the US and in the Philippines. Welcome, Jedi. So we're gonna jump into a few questions that we've prepared. We're gonna do two questions that we have prepared and then we'll open it up to the rest of you to ask whatever questions you have because this is all about you and getting your questions answered. Um, so panelists, which contemporary movements have you been affiliated with and why have you participated in these movements? No, anyone that wants to answer it can just go ahead and answer and you don't all have to answer the question. Sorry, can we just have you turn the mics on? That would help. Thank you. Is this on now? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So anyway, what inspired me to get involved in the Tibetan freedom movement was the repression of religious freedom by the People's Republic of China. 
Another issue that I was involved with was bringing attention to sex trafficking. And for the last 20 years, I've been involved with an organization called Captive Daughters. And I got involved because I feel that being a sexual slave is probably the worst form of slavery that one can imagine. And currently, I'm involved with a documentary, which is bringing attention to victims of anti-personnel bombs in Laos during the Vietnam War. The CIA and the Air Force conducted a secret war, and we dropped cluster bombs, which littered 270 million anti-personnel bombs in Laos. It's going to take hundreds of years to clean up those anti-personnel bombs. to just add and I uh, just want to say thank you for allowing me to be here and and for all of us to be here on Tongva Gabrielino land that we're on today that we sit upon and the ancestors that um, have allowed us to continue in the water that we partake and I just want to say thank you to our ancestors for allowing us to be here but I, I understand that the question is, you know, contemporary movements as an indigenous person and indigenous people that are here I would say that we are just generations continuing on the movements that we've been going on. As indigenous peoples, we were uh, the first and to go into public education, the first into the sex trafficking, the first into being victims of domestic violence by colonialism, the first in, in rape, and the first into environmental justice the first into all these movements that today exist as a contemporary movement. For us as Native people, it's just the next generation to continue on the movements that we have been ongoing since time immemorial. Since time that colon the colonization has stepped foot into these lands, into the Western Hemisphere, that uh, it's an ongoing process of the movement for us. It's about uh, Indian education. It's about environmental justice. It's about you know, the alcoholism that has brought into our communities, the drug addiction that has brought into our communities, the isolation, the violence, the generational trauma, a lot of things that we as Indian people have a lot of work to do. And what we can do now is for you that are supporters of Native causes and Native issues, uh, just like many was and Standing Rock that put the map there for social media to see of Indian existence. We ask of you to support our causes. And when we do have Native events, be there to support. And not just um, have us as guest uh, in your home or guest in a, to be seated in, next to you, but let a partner with us and say we work with Native people. Not just I have her sitting here next to me, but I actually work with this individual. And that's the difference between working with communities or just having a guest on a panel. So I ask that today, I want to work with many of you. I want to partner up with many of you because together we can make a difference with our Native population. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much for that blessing and for mentioning um, everything that you just went over because in my experience, um, which might be similar to anyone that's in this room, I just got involved with activism uh, ever since the nomination went out. <laughs> And I was very upset of what was going on in the country, and I got I started liking Facebook pages just because I wanted to be involved. And one of those pages um, was coming out of Standing Rock, and I, I kept watching these videos, and I remember it being um, around November, um, and about a year and a half ago, two years, and um, I saw, I don't know if you guys watched it because it became national news where the water cannons were used against all the indigenous people and activists that were out there. And I remember watching that and I couldn't believe that it was true because policemen are supposed to protect us, the people that you know basically hire them and pay them with our taxes. And I couldn't believe that this was happening. So um, 
I spoke to Kyle, who's here. Um, he's also part of the media, because um, I'm involved with entertainment and journalism and acting and all of that stuff. Um, and I told him, we have to go there with our cameras, because at that point, um, mass media wasn't involved. The only media that was coming out of there was independent um, social media groups. And it was only when it got really, um, it became sort of a spectacle and a show that mass media showed up. It was only when the water canyons came out and where people getting hurt and there were dogs biting actual people that the mass media, the NBCs, the ABCs, that all came out because they knew it was going to be a ratings show rather than a supportive show. Um, so just going back to my start, um, I watched those videos. I booked a flight and we uh, drove to Minnesota and then drove for about eight hours, I think it was, to Standing Rock. And what was astonishing to me was the way that we were greeted because right when we walked in in our cars, well, drove in in our cars, we were blessed by one of the indigenous um, brothers that were there and they told us the rules of the camp. There were no guns allowed, no um, alcohol, no drugs allowed. And after that, um, you just basically chose a place to stay for the night in 23 degree weather, it was snowing. Um, and the next day you had an orientation at 8 a.m. where they were introducing people just like me that that was our first event in activism, what to do. What happened if you did get arrested? There was a lawyer's group where you would go and get instructed on to write down um, a lawyer's phone number on your arm in case you got arrested. Um, so it was it was a very extreme way to get introduced to activism, <laughs> um, but it was definitely just everything in one. And in that that same day, we were able to be part of actions, and we were able to be part of um, sort of an introduction also to indigenous culture that I wasn't aware of. But you know what a, a sacred camp is, what a sacred fire is, the elders, how to respect them, and how to um, understand that we are standing on stolen ground, and that we need to recognize that because we're all a guest in this land, unless you're a Native American. Um, and then going past that, I know I'm taking a lot of time, but. Um, Going past Standing Rock, I came back um, and I got involved right away with, I just looked up organizations in LA and I found March and Rally Los Angeles and I was like, hey, how can I help? So I became a live streamer for them because I believe in the power of social media and I think all of us here have that power as well. So after that, I was part of the, um, the ban, uh, the travel ban in Los Angeles in, at LAX where with that organization we were able to shut down the airport for about seven hours, which is unheard of. <laughs> and um, it was amazing to see the amount of people that came out to the, to the airport, as well as um, lawyers that donated their time and their work and set up random. You would walk down the airport and see a lawyer's office. We just grabbed tables and anybody who needed help would get the help that they needed. And we stayed there until the last family was released. It was, it was late, it was a couple of days as well because after the big ban happened, um, we kept coming back. And then after that, um, with March and Rally Los Angeles, I was able to get involved with um, the immigrants uh, march and um, just different marches as well as the women's march. And I just, I'm, I'm saying all of this because two years ago I was just like you, just interested. And it really just takes a small amount of interest and a little digging on social media or just Google to get involved. So if anyone here is mad or has questions or wants to talk to anyone, there are many organizations that can um, go to the needs that you have as far as what you're looking for to help out. Um, so that's basically the gist of what I've gotten involved with. And then as far as the book that I'm putting together, um, I got the idea at the Women's March in Washington that night because I was like, I have to record this. This is part of history. And I, I got this, this book. And I have stories here from many women that were just marching. And I'll share with you guys later if we have some time, because I know I'm still talking. Uh, but the book is basically a book written by women that assisted the march and any allies, any men. I also have a couple of men. Um, but it's basically about our story, why we marched, or why didn't you march, or if you were opposed, opposing the march. All those stories are going to be piled up in one book, which is the Women's March, Our Story. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how I got involved and how easily anyone else can get involved. We'll do, um, we'll do one more. 
Uh, yeah, so I can go ahead real quick. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Solorzano. I'm a uh, community organizer for the Long Beach American Rights Coalition. Uh, I also graduated from Long Beach City College uh, a few years back and uh, transferred over to Cal State LA where I uh, got a degree in sociology. Um, <clears throat> but it's always great to come back here, honestly. Um, there's nothing like coming back to the place where all of this started for me. And uh, like the sister said earlier, you know, it's very easy to get involved. Um, here on campus, I found uh, the Coalition for Latino Advancement, uh, now known, I believe, as a Coalition for Latinx Advancement. Um, it's, it's an organization that focuses on um, providing resources and services for undocumented immigrants here in, on this campus and in the local community. Um, so that's really what I've been focusing on for the past five years. I've uh, worked with the undocumented immigrant communities here in the city and then just in the rest of the South Bay Area um, because we realized that there is a lot, there's a heavy need of resources here in this area. We know, we know Los Angeles carries the bulk of those resources. Um, we know a lot of folks, you know, take the metro up there to, to go to um, notarios, attorneys. And here in the city, you know, we don't have enough of that or we don't hear too much about that. Uh, so our organization started around uh, 12 years ago where <clears throat> our executive directors were going up to LA for the marches back in 2006. I don't know how many of you actually remember that. Um, or you know we're even old enough to remember that um, <laughs> but um, on the way back our executive directors saw that there was a big need for uh, resources here in the city just because um, you know these are the same folks that go on the blue line these are the same folks that go up to 710 up to 110 and um, you know having to do that on a consistent basis is very difficult sometimes so we decided we wanted to provide uh, resources here in the city um, and then it wasn't until not uh, maybe the last four years uh, when DACA came out, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, heard of that program. Um, great, great. Uh, so when that program came out, um, we really saw that there was a big need for uh, resources for undocumented communities. And for me personally, that's when I got introduced to the movement uh, here on this campus, when I got a chance to meet undocumented students who um, shared stories with me about uh, their difficulties of getting through school, right? And these are stories that, you know, for me, who has the privilege of being born here, uh, I would say it's something I would have never imagined for myself, but uh, are very real stories and very troubling stories for people um, in our communities. And so this gave me the opportunity to give back in, this, in, a, in a way. Um, once I graduated and transferred, I continued my activism and organizing uh, when it came to um, community, community colleges as well as the CSU system. Um, when I transferred over to Cal State LA, I helped participate in the creation of a Dream Resource Center, something I know this campus is currently talking about, and I'm really m very much looking forward to seeing that created. Uh, and then finally, on a personal note, uh, this, this topic is very important to me personally because my dad was actually deported back when I was 13 years old. So I understand firsthand what it's like to, to really live with that struggle, right? To understand um, what it's like to have a missing parent. Uh, to experience family separation, something that this administration today um, is hell-bent on doing <clears throat> on a national level. And, you know, to disregard that as policy and not address that as a human rights violation, I think is doing a disservice to many of our community members here uh, and throughout the country. So that's essentially why I do this work. We're gonna, I'd like to uh, share a little bit of what my involvement Go ahead, in, in movements. I think that's, yes. that's been shared that I was born in Africatown, Alabama, and that experience was 112 Africans were brought to Africatown in 1859 uh, by two white men bet that they could get a shipload of slaves into the United States without being detected. And they proceeded to do that, and they were detected when they came into the Mobile Harbor. Uh, and that was five years before, uh, about five years before 
uh, Lincoln uh, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But those people were brought into this country illegally, as a lot of other things was done illegally. They were brought to Africatown, and, uh, and it became Africatown because after they took them up to the plantation after being detected, they uh, were, they were, uh, they brought themselves back into the Mobile Harbor and s established their own community. And so my connection and my experience and why I have been involved in movements, my life is the poster child for what movements, what created movements. Uh, movements, slavery, slavery, when you are a slave and all of your rights and all of your being and all of everything that you will ever know is someone else taking advantage of your life and making you into something that's less than human, that you have to live generation after generation in that kind of life leaves you no choice but to be involved in what you need to be doing to be the kind of person that you already are, taking your dignity, your value, your being, killing my grandfather because, just because, he wanted and he was working for and building houses for a man in Alabama and this other man wanted him to come and build houses for him and he told him he wanted to keep his job and he hired the local sheriff to kill him and that's what he did when my father was just 12 years old, and he was, that was, what was taken away was his father's life and rendered him and my father and all of his siblings without a support system to take care of them. So my father ended up coming to Africatown where he met my mother and they got married and they had 10 children and I'm the oldest of the 10 and so I was born hearing the stories, what happened to my ancestors, seeing every day of my life, segregation, discrimination, you can't drink out of this fountain, you can't ride in this bus, you can't have this job just because you are the person that you are, having African ancestry and having it as an enslaved background, and so, Movements just was my life, and it's still my life, because the people that created what we had to endure are the people who is creating what people are enduring today, and it never goes away. So that's why I'm into movements. I was in the women's movement. I was in the civil rights movement. I'm in the children's movement. I'm in the movement movement. And I will never be out of movement as long as we have the situation that we have today. Yeah, that's what's uh -huh. up. Uh, so yeah, shout out to, to all my co-panelists here today. Um, I know we're like running short on time, so we'll, we'll support each other. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, my name is Jedi. Uh, I'm born and raised in Long Beach. Shout out to all my Long Beach natives, everybody in Long Beach. Okay, that's what's up. Uh, so yeah, I've been involved since I was actually, uh, fr uh, you know, fresh out of high school. I was 15. So, um, you know, with the organization I'm involved with, Anak Bayan Long Beach. Anak Bayan, uh, Anak means like child uh, or son or daughter. And then Bayan means like uh, countrymen or our country. So, you know, sons and daughters of our people, sons and daughters of our country, just so, you know, when, when you hear that name um, in Tagalog. So, yeah, I've been involved since I was 15. You know, it was through um, hip hop that I wanted to get involved. And, you know, growing up in Long Beach, I ha I've had a lot of, you know, life experiences. Um, you know, when you grow up in the city where, you know, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of, you know, your, your family members are also victims of, you know, the justice system and, you know, my pops, he did drugs and like my family did drugs and they, you know, like I came from a very dysfunctional family, you know, with my experience coming from Long Beach. So, you know, I, I think when I, that was like the one thing that I wanted to, um, you know, change and, and really be part of something that's bigger than myself. You know, I've seen my own friends go to jail for life. You know, I see my own friends die from, you know, gun violence, you know, especially that's like the, the thing right now, right? But it's been affecting our communities ever since, you know? So 
how I got involved was through realizing, you know, the oppression I was facing growing up um, and, you know, being a high school dropout and, and um, you know, feeling like hopeless and that nobody cares, you know. And when I joined Anak Bayan, I was able to learn about, you know, what my people went through, what the Filipinos um, went through here in the U.S. and what Filipinos go through in the Philippines. And that's what Anak Bayan, you know, aims to address is that our struggles here as Filipinos are tied to the struggle back home in the Philippines. And there's a reason for that. Um, you know, same with the struggles of all, you know, uh, oppressed communities um, back to their motherland. It traces back to um, their home country because of the corruption, because of poverty. That's why my, my family had to leave to come here to chase the American dream. That American dream was a lie, you know. So um, I think, you know, as, as for y'all, you know, students and faculty and everybody here, um, you know, y'all you sh should get involved and get involved in your local organizations here in the city, on campus, because it's the time right now. We, we can't be sitting around, you know, just like writing notes and then leave home and then, you know, look on social media and that's it. It's time to get involved with your friends. Organize your family members. Organize your, your homies, your loved ones, because that, you know, it's going to take a movement to, to fight against, you know, um, the, the powers that be that oppresses um, all of our communities, oppressed communities. Um, so, you know, hopefully after this, you know, it can connect with all of us and be able to, you know, organize and get involved in your community. So that's why, you know, that's the, the movement. Um, oh, and also, sorry, we're, 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 uh, we have about 200 plus chapters in the Philippines, all over the Philippines. And we're part of a larger movement fighting for the freedom of um, the Filipino people called the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines. Um, and who here has heard of Duterte, the dictator right now in the Philippines, uh, and the drug wars and the killings? Yeah, so I'll be speaking on that a little later. Um, but yeah, there's, um, you know, there's definitely uh, a lot, lots of opportunities to, to really unite uh, our communities um, against this dictatorship because this dictatorship is also being supported by Donald Trump and this country um, and the government here. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Would any other panelists like to answer the question? Well, um, I'd like uh, first to say, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon all of you. Wa alaikum salam, good. <laughs> Already. Um, well, actually, uh, Miss uh, Evelyn, she encouraged me and she moved <laughs> me to talk about uh, <clears throat> this, uh, you know, the experience I have regarding a, a, a social movement. Uh, I am a Muslim. And Islam is built inside of me a lot of resistance toward oppression, toward dictatorship. Any regime, it doesn't give me the opportunity to expose my opinion. Islam as a religion built inside of every single Muslim to stand and talk and move toward that. I, I have an honor that uh, I share my brother and sister in um, Mexican society, when they have the wall and when they have the wage movement, uh, I, I, I share with them and I went and I stand. And I'm a, I know American full by movement, left and right, but let me shift your opinion outside the United States a little bit. And if you do remember in 1993 and 94, the Balkan War or Kosovo War. I'm not sure if you remember that. Uh, we built a very, very beautiful, strong uh, social movement uh, to uh, stop the massacre and what's going on toward the people and civilian people. Also, I share the movement toward Gaza. I remember you know, this international conflict between Israel and Palestinian for, for very close to decade right now. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, share, share, and I, I, I share the time to uh, uh, participate in this kind of movement. And very humbly, I thought Gaza is a civilian people and they shouldn't get attacked by F-16 and all this is machine gun and, you know, take over the land. Uh, also, I, uh, if you all remember what happened when um, the election and the Donald Trump being elected, 
you remember the registration and the, they try to register the people, especially the, the Muslim when they come over from over the airport and all this stuff. Well, and this is actually kind of movement they call it Islamophobia. And I'm telling you this, this is the movement. The movement is right there, you can see it. But we do not until right now build a, a resistant movement. We don't know what gonna call it to stop the Islamophobia to take and attack in the Muslim society in the United States. And last, I am I'm the chairman of Long Beach Islamic Center, and one time we have letters coming to us, threatening us, you are like this, you are like that, we're going to, to do something for you. I personally get the threatening a lot. So anyway, I ignore this as letters, but look at our community, look at our, the society. Uh, all the churches get together, all the synagogue get together, and we have a beautiful movement, again, toward them, and we move and walk and march toward the, our mosque or masjid, and we have a very, even the mayor of Long Beach being there attending the, and the city council and, and, and the congress people, they come and attend this is movement. It's a small movement. We don't have no name for it yet. We don't give a label for it yet, but I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm drawing the, the attention for Professor uh, Jeanette Hunter, that this movement, we need to give it name, we need to build the resistance, and this is actually a very, very good experience for our community to have. Yes, you need to move day and night, defend your right, and this is what we need to build our organization according to. Thank you. So I'd actually like to open up the floor to the students. Anyone who has a question, feel free to come up to the microphone and um, ask. Not all at once. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Basically, you shared that you know what being having a dad being deported is like. I don't know what that's like. I think it's important that you share what it's like. You know, because um, I want to understand what is it like. And uh, my second question uh, was. Um, Evelyn Knight. Evelyn Knight. Evelyn. Evelyn. Mm -hmm. You've been uh, obviously involved in a lot of movements. I yes. want to know uh, what's the difference between that you can see the movements of today compared to the movements of yesterday. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> so the question was, uh, what 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 is the comparison between the movements, past movements, and movements today? The, the thing that is different from today's movement and the movement in the 60s, the biggest movement that I was involved in, in in the 60s, is the way the people get involved in the movements and the communication system. Back in the 60s, we didn't have social media. Uh, we were communicated with on the national networks. When Martin Luther King uh, came on TV in 1965, as a reaction and a result of what had happened on Bloody Sunday, and asked everybody that heard that he could speak to to come to Selma to protest the brutality that 
that had gone on on that Sunday and be there Tuesday to respond. Social media is pretty much the way people get their information today. Uh, what, is, what drives movements is, is, is similar. What people need to respond, react, and fight against oppressive forces that is destroying them. The beating up of those people. The, the, they only wanted the right to vote, which was what they should have had in the first place. So they was just expressing, expressing their democratic right to stand up and, and request and, and, and petition the government for what they needed to have. And the government, the people and the government responded by beating them up and, and destroying them and, 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 uh, and not permitting them their rights. Uh, so, and that's what's happening with the children. They, they were killing the people. They still are killing the children. And it's the same power uh, driven by greed and money and, and, and political capital that is used for the wrong purpose. It's the same today. So, so many times this, it's the same forces that drive the behavior, but it's to, the tools that people have and how they express their movements and how they organize their movements, is, it depends on what's available to them. And you have to use your resources. Movements need resources just like the people have resources to do the things that they are using against you. So everybody has to have the same things, but they use them for different purposes, good purposes and bad purposes. And so that's what's going on, what was going on then and what is going on now. And that's true with what happened to the Indians in their movement. And that's what happened to the women in their movements. They were oppressed, they were denied their rights and their freedoms, and they were abused. That's what happened to the slaves. They were not slaves. These people were people who were made into slaves. <laughs> Slavery is something you create. These people were not slaves. They were human beings like everybody else. And they had lives, and they had families, and they had wonderful things in their lives. But then the lies come and say, you know, they, oh, the slaves was caught here because that was just wonderful for them to get away from Africa. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> anyway, that's what's going on. The propaganda machines are used, and they're alive and well all the time for the purposes for which they're set up to be used for. And someone asked, let's tell the truth. Well, that is the truth. And those are the facts. And we can prove it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then the, uh, the question directed at Jonathan was uh, that he would please share what it's like to have his father deported. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I do want to thank you for your question. I think it's a question that you know, I, I'd had a lot of time to think about, um, but rarely share, I guess. But um, yeah, I, like, I want to start off by starting off with a quote. Um, Be the person you wish you had when you were younger. Uh, so I'll go ahead and repeat that. So be the person you wish you were, or the wish you wish you had when you were younger. Um, that's basically what I've been trying to do this past couple of years, uh, trying to gain knowledge as to how to help out uh, my community, um, you know, how to prevent separ family separations and deportations. Um, because when I was a kid, when I was 13, I remember trying to become my own advocate, really, just going into you know, Google searches, um, you know, looking up litigation, looking up law cases. And a 13-year-old normally doesn't do that, right? Um, but that's exactly what I was doing. And so that, I think that kind of led me to this point in my life where I know, and I knew you know, a while, for a while now that I wanted to become an immigration attorney. Um, so I'm currently studying for the LSAT, and you know, I'm hoping things go well from there. But um, I mean, that's just you know on the surface. I think on the you know internally, once you start really get into it, there's many layers uh, to address, right? The mental well-being of somebody, 
um, the, the toll that it takes on not only the individual, but the family, right? Uh, the community and, and how they're affected. So, um, you know, I, I also recognize, and you also got to be positive about, you know, the situation. So, um, I, I do also recognize that being born here kind of, it, it allows me certain privileges, right? One is the ability to be able to go see him in Mexico. Uh, something I know a lot of people who are undocumented or who come from, you know, 100% undocumented families don't have. And that is something that I have used to my advantage many times, right? Going to Tijuana or, you know, if I have enough money and time uh, that I'm able to take off from work, I can go down to Mexico and, and visit him. Um, growing up, I will say, I, I do remember one particular story where um, I think kind of culminates this whole sentiment, right? Um, I went to Lakewood High School, which is not too far from here. And during that time, I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was a freshman uh, hanging out with seniors and juniors, just a lot of older kids, right? Um, some can say that's probably me looking for a parental or a father figure in a sort of way. And um, I, I was kind of starting to slip into this, uh, this, this gang lifestyle, right? Um, you know, just getting into trouble here and there, nothing too major. Because I also knew that back home, uh, I had my mom waiting for me and I, I took that into consideration, right? Knowing that um, as a housewife, she had to stop doing that and had to go out and get a job. And that's particularly scary for someone who has been in this country for, you know, basically the whole time I've been born. And all of a sudden having to pick up a new language having to pick up um, a different set of work skills and really just getting out there to, to you know, make it happen for herself and, and her kids. I have a younger sister as well. And you know, these are things that you don't really hear about in the, in the media, right? But we as a community uh, recognize all too often that this, this is the reality of our communities, right? Coming from working class communities of color, uh, coming from marginalized, underrepresented communities. These are the realities that we face on a daily basis. And so, you know, it's, it's actually a little fitting that this is actually a, um, a sociological panel, right? Because, you know, I can share my story all day long, and it's a story of self. But once you begin understanding that there's other people that go through these same issues or suffer the same consequences, um, you begin to realize that, you know what, there's an opportunity to collaborate, there's an opportunity to get together and really make something happen for ourselves, for our communities, for our families. And, you know, the time is now. I mean, the time really is now to, to get together. I'm actually really, really surprised and really happy with the turnout of today's event. So, I mean, give yourselves a round of applause for being here. And I, will, I do want to end with, um, you know, just sharing that it's, it, it was definitely difficult overall. I mean, it, it was a very difficult situation, but, um, you know, I, I was very lucky. I was very fortunate to have the resources around me to, to really make something happen. Um, you know, now I'm not exactly saying I achieved all of my goals, but I am in a place where I am very capable of helping other people. And I, I, I really, really hold myself to, um, to that standard of, of really coming through for other, other folks. And, uh, and in the process, really just, you know, it, that, that becomes really fulfilling for me personally. Um, but also realizing that there's a lot more work to be done. So here we are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd like to say, too, along that line, uh, another thing that was different and, and, and similar uh, during the 60s and what's going on now, um, the young people were very much engaged in the 60s on the campuses. The free speech movement, I attended rallies in Berkeley with the people organizing for the free speech movement. There was a lot, the campuses in the, in the uh, 60s, they roiled with protest. Their children were killed at uh, Kent State and all kinds of things was going on to protest the wars uh, SNCC was organizing all over the South, uh, getting voter registrations and participating in all kinds of organized activity. I participated and went back to Lowndes County, Alabama to uh, work in the first election with SNCC 
in, eight, in 1966, after the Voting Rights Bill was passed, and there were nothing but young people involved in that. The, the churches were organized, and those were the, most of the adults uh, that was around the churches, and, and they were focused on certain kinds of communities and, and doing things to uh, promoting civil rights and voting and that kind of thing. So they were already organized bodies that the churches were, were uh, involved in that. I haven't, you know, the, the churches have been, many of them, some of them have been, uh, you know, the voices have been heard, but it's not as like it was the 60s. And so it's not as much participation by the organized churches. They have been, and many of them have been out there promoting the other stuff. <laughs> That's not in the, you know, the best interests of the rights of the people. You know, you know the evangelicals and some of the, the things that people espouse, you know, that it's not, it, it's, it's about the status quo. So, you know, those are some of the different kinds of things that, that I experience. I'm talking about Evelyn now. I'm not talking about everybody else. <laughs> I do agree with you so much um, of the differences, and I very much so I agree with you. But I wanted to, uh, just like somebody was to share their story about deportation, you know, as Indian people, we have our stories. Maybe the terminology of vocabulary is not the word deportation, but we too, our stories, we say that we were enslaved, we were taken, we were kidnapped mm -hmm. from our families, from wherever homes that we were at, we were taken as children far, far away. If you lived in Arizona, you may have been taken as a five-year-old child to a, board, a thing called boarding school. The first thing of public education from Arizona, could you imagine being forced and taken, being kidnapped to another place, perhaps in Kansas, and not seeing your mom and dad until 10 years later. And so you have to remember that being separ that separation has occurred to Native peoples, but yet we are the most marginalized community where our voices are not being shared. And I thank Janae Hun that we're here today because I want you to learn about our voice. Mm -hmm. Because many of you may have a connection to a homeland outside of this Western Hemisphere. But as for Native peoples here, this is all we got. Mm -hmm. We've survived different countries under California rule, different presidents under this rule, but this is all we got. This land is all we got. We don't got nowhere else to go to say, I'm gonna go you know, take care of my house in this other country. Mm -hmm. That's not how we talk. We have to say, this is our land, this is how we're gonna take care of it, and this is what we gotta do, whether we have to die for it because <laughs> We're generations deep, born and raised here, and we're generations deep being buried here. Mm -hmm. Lupe, going off of, of what you said, in learning about your voice, what advice would the panelists have for the students in, in regards to getting involved in social movements and um, keeping the momentum going? Because what we're seeing is that social movements come up and there's a lot of momentum, but then they kind of simmer down and they lose their, their speed. And so what can we as students do to keep the momentum going and to keep others engaged with us? I got, I got a quote, sorry. Uh, so I, I got a quote you know, to, to really respond to that, right? Um, this quote comes from a, a Filipino revolutionary. He's one of the, rev the pioneers of uh, the, the, the Communist Party of the Philippines, um, of the revolution in the Philippines uh, back in the 60s. So there's a, a quote, he said, a nation does n that does not continuously renew itself through progressive minded and militant youth cannot possibly advance. So, you know, that itself shows that young people are the ones that are creating changes um, for the better, you know, for, of society. And throughout history, it's always been youth. And, you know, folks here, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks here are young, you know, young folks, youth, um, and just everybody in general, you, you know, especially in the times right now that we're living in, uh, you know, it's, it's important for us to, to get involved um, in your local organizations because, uh, you know, it, we really need it. You know, this world needs it right now. Um, all, all across the world um, is, is suffering, you know, and we can't stand to, 
you know, sit down anymore and, and really uh, stand back, you know. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's how, you know, everybody can get involved for sure. Well, uh, I have a question for, the, for all the students and the professors and the panels at the same time. Why we have to wait to build movement after the disaster happened? <laughs> Why we are being just reflect instead of to lead and do some work before the disaster happened? And can we have like a vision to the future? What is threatening our community? And we can build the movement according to this? Let's say, for example, why we don't think about what is going to happen in the next 100 years if the United States is going to be the same? Can we build a movement to keep the state together? together? Can we build a movement, say, American only or American brothers? It, that's movement going to be in every state to try to keep united as united state? Uh, you know, we all know about the, the civilization growing up and getting strong and after getting weak and some disease get in and feel down. Can we do something? I mean, um, the question is why we always have to build a movement after the disaster happened. Now, as a Muslim, we have a movement toward the United States, I mean, toward the United States uh, as, an, as a society. Before we, this happened, can we just like have a vision or something like that? Just the question. I want to I wanna lay the question so everybody and please you know, come with answer if you're able to. I, I would like to respond to and, 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 and second that, that, that motion that he just made. Why do we allow our movements to stop <laughs> when the things that created us, the need for us to have a movement never goes away? The people who don't want us to move forward never leave. Why don't the movement continue and why don't we build strong, powerful, sustainable, institutions to protect us all the time. We can do that. Why don't we have uh, a people's lobbies for all the people all the time in Washington, D.C. and all over the United States? Why don't we walk across the country every time we need to walk across the country to wake the town and tell the people all the time? up and down across the United States of America because people suffer everywhere in the United States. They all over the place, the same people with the same things happening to them, done by the same people that do things all the time to people. So what is wrong with, why don't we want to work hard for ourselves like we work hard for everybody else to get what they want? I don't know. Let's answer that. <laughs> Let's think about it. Let's put that I, oh, oh, it does work. Um, I kind of have an idea or an answer for that. Um, we, it, you said that we need resources to keep social movements going. And I think the distribution of resource and wealth has changed over time since it was in the past. Now it's more extreme. The curve of wealth is very, very low for most of the population, in America at least, and extremely high for the last 20, five, 20 or five to one percent. So I think it's the lack of resource, the lack of even wealth distribution um, that leaves us in that place, that lets us let go of these social movements because we are so focused on just trying to live just trying to provide for our, our families and trying to ser get ourselves out of um, the historical uh, repression or oppression. You know? Very good, yeah. very good. And look, and it's yeah, so much I, like the survival. I, 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 let me just say a couple of things to that. You're absolutely right. That's what happened. Why did we allow it to happen? <laughs> you know, why don't we like 
Why don't you we know, watch? nobody's going to take care of us but us. Right. The people have to take care of the people. It's true. And I think, um, I mean, the only power we truly have is power in numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is the tool of the power itself is to separate us. You know, separation is the reason why we don't have this power and that we are letting it become the way that it is today. It's the separation. Are we saying they're, they're smarter than we are? No. <laughs> okay. We have more brains. Well, yes, you are smarts. <laughs> but, you know. but, you know, it's, it's the tools that they use um, to separate, to s discriminate, to group people and categorize people away from each other when we need to start seeing our similarities more than our differences. Absolutely. So I think that's And we can do that. Why don't we do that? I know. Yeah. Come on, guys. <laughs> uh, you okay. talked about wealth. Many of them are born into wealth. Once, they're, once they're a, a child in, in that community is born, I mean, there's like a $5 million you know, policy on them. So when they turn 18, they're, they're wealthy. And so they have the time, they have the money, they have the staff people to absolutely do whatever they can. If I can just be a person where my um, mortgage can be paid and my gas can be filled up and my vehicle uh, can be paid for, you know what, I'll be doing this every day, all day, each and every one of us. But we're in a situation that we do this tirelessly every day. Why? Because we have that love for our people. But we also have the love for our children, our love for our generations to come, to do the work that we're doing. But I really, um, I, I say to you, thank you for your knowledge, uh, because it's the numbers that, the few that we are uh, in this generation, that we're so split up into different movements that it's hard for us to stay focused and let it known the fact that you're here today because your goal is to graduate from school. And you as a person, you're doing what you can to graduate and be in a movement and take care of a family and take care of maybe help with the rent with your mother and father. And there's so much going on in our life that it, it seems like we're just bubbled in this situation. So thank you so much. And you, you hit it right on it, girl. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so uh, my question is for any of the panelists who would like to answer. Um, given the interconnectedness that we see here amongst many of these movements going on, is there any solutions that you can imagine in the future of, uh, of the society that we're in with all these movements that are happening that shouldn't even be necessary, that we're resisting, we're standing up, and we're using our voices? Um, what kind of solutions can you offer or do you imagine um, that you could share from your experience, from your, your perspective, from your um, organizations that you work with or your people that you represent? Um, I'd like to address the earlier question and also part of this, how to get involved because I think it's just very easy steps. Um, one of the first steps would be identifying what you don't agree with because there are so many movements that we see online and we, at least I like to be part of a lot of them, but I don't necessarily agree with certain specifics of, of, of one of the movements, let's say. So I think the first step definitely before getting involved would be identifying what you don't agree with and what you're willing to dedicate your time to. The second step would be finding an organization that you can be part of. There's a lot of organizations that have weekly meetings. You just can't find out where it is. Go check it out. Basically audit what they stand for and if you agree with it then you become part of their organization if you don't agree with it you can either try to change and be an active member of that or go find a different organization so it's an ongoing process um, to find the group that you vibe with just as it is finding a friend on campus um, so definitely find what's wrong with the system and what you don't agree with. Second, find an organization. And third, be active. And active means anything from just reposting, resharing, commenting, being in a meeting, and then following up with becoming part of the organizing team, doing an event with them. There are different levels of activism that you can do, and each level is important. So even if you can just repost or reshare, you're already amplifying the message and multiplying it within your audience. So any of those steps you can um, get involved with. And then as far as the second question, um, how do we at least 
envision some solutions. I think the, the main thing we need to figure out right now as a nation is our clear message to what's wrong. Because there are so many movements and we're all seeking different things that I feel that if we can combine forces and have an actual list of policies that we're looking to change, then we'll get something done. Because a lot of the success from the 60s was that there was a clear message. You know, it's the, we want voting rights. We want, uh, for women, for African Americans, we want to stop segregation. It was a clear thing. And just like the success of March for Our Lives is, is that they're going after assault weapons. So it's, you know, change the policy. That's it. Um, and I think the issue right now is that we have so many different messages that are really important, but they're all sort of divided and not that clear. So I think for the future, for all of us to have success in what we're doing is just to narrow down what we're looking to do and what we're looking to change, even in the Constitution and as a policy. Because one thing is to march and talk and make noise, which is great to get the attention, but the follow-up is the legislation that you're gonna change. Because without the law being changed, there is no actual progress. So that's what I think. The United States has a big emphasis on being empathetic and sometimes that does lead to apathy. Have you guys found ways to kind of spark up or bring life to your movements of it and bring people in, in new and interesting ways with the developments of technology and things? Yeah, I could I could respond to that question. Like especially, you know, with youth nowadays, you know, we, we got trans, we're creative, you know, we we have uh, we have the skills, you know, as young people. Um, and, and we could, you know, the, the, that's the strength of the young people is that, you know, we're we're not tied to like, you know, huge responsibilities. We're always willing to learn uh, learn new theory, read, you know, study and uh, you know, really like so like how we have that social skill. And I think with, with young people now, um, I think that's like one of the strengths uh, in order for to get other people involved. Um, and, and that goes for like the co-panelists too, like all of us here, like we also have to think about creative ways to, to how to like draw people in. And, and y'all too, you know, young, young, young people and students and just as people in general, like we need, y'all need to think about uh, what will bring people in, what will draw people in because, you know, especially how, for me it's like, uh, I'm, I just can't talk about like long, big, huge terms. You know, it's it's not really gonna work if you talk about you know you try to sound like academic. You know, to like somebody in the hood or in your neighborhood or your even even your classmate. You know, that's why I think like it's important for us to understand what's going on, uh, just just on a human level. You know, as uh, yeah, like I don't think it. You know, it's attractive if someone, somebody were to come up to me and talk about we should fight against imperialism right now. Like, you know, it's just like you 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 need to you need to break it down. What does imperialism mean? You know, what does uh, this country look like as far as uh, oppressing all of our uh, communities? Breaking it down instead of you know saying these huge terms that actually a lot of working class people don't even understand. You know, and exactly, and and I'm a victim of that. I'm a victim of this you know, uh, this public education system. And what I, that's the thing I learned um, as I grew older, was that uh, it's, it's set up, you know, like DJ Khaled said, they don't want us to resist. I mean, he didn't say that, but he said they don't want, you know, they don't want us to resist. So, you know, that's why it's important for us to, to really understand uh, and connect uh, on a human level, like the, the social uh, ills of society and, and how we could, you know, uh, link, link our struggles together and then raise it to a higher level of unity because, you know, we see that now, like everybody was saying, right? Like solidarity is important and like, you know, we have a common enemy, you know what I'm saying? So. Mm -hmm. And I'll just go off a little bit on that. Um, as far as um, the organizations that I work with, um, what we focus on is doing a, a, a hashtag that can embody what the message of the march will be. Um, so usually developing those hashtags, it does take some time to think about it because it's a very short uh, amount of words that you can use to get the message out, but it's something that anyone can just do really quickly and spread the word. So definitely hashtagging. I would say if you guys have friends or if 
you're like me, that I was the first of my group of friends that started being really vocal, and then you start getting looks, and you're like, hey, uh, you know, can we talk about this, or can I go to the march with you? Um, what I started doing was definitely reposting photos from events, um, doing my own memes, because comedy is always a great way to invite people to your message instead of preach about it, um, because preaching always puts people off. Um, so I would say if you want to approach anyone to join you, definitely use a friendly approach. Comedy always works great. And if you want to, there's, you have cell phones, not everybody has a cell phone of some sort, internet access, you can create any sort of video. And I would say, um, obviously, controversy always works. And being really blunt gets attention. So if you're thinking about producing your own small video for Instagram, whatever it is, 30 seconds, whatever you want to do, um, have your message be concise and clear. And if you want to be blunt, be blunt. If you want to be funny, be funny. But just get it out. Even using hip hop and music. That's a, yeah. Yeah, you got you got to speak up. Uh, well, for me, I, I will say um, we recently started uh, working with youth, uh, particularly high school youth, and it's it's great to see them uh, continue getting involved, right? Uh, they find an issue that they're very passionate about, and we also understand that there's uh, different time constraints or different responsibilities that take up their times, and so, uh, you know, as an organizer, I think one thing you do have to keep in mind is being respectful of that, right? Understanding that... Um, this is just one aspect of their lives, right? There's many, many facets to um, anybody's life, right? Um, at being active or being an organizer is simply one. Um, but, you know, very, very similar to the uh, conversation we're having about intersectionality, I mean, I'm very much affected by all the other, um, you know, issues that are being addressed today, right? Uh, with the environment, I mean, I've lived by the 710 freeway my whole life, for most of my life. I'm affected by environmental racism, right? Um, I'm also affected by uh, police brutality, you know, being a person of color. And so, just to give you some examples, right? So, um, when you see youth speak up about these issues, we understand that um, these are, this is, this really is the future, right? This is um, a reflection of the work we've been putting in and seeing how certain people, certain youth, um, reciprocate that message and continue becoming active, um, continue asking the hard questions, continue pushing elected officials, um, hosting actions uh, in, in their communities, shutting down streets, freeways. Um, this is all the result of 
what the people before us left, right? So, I mean, uh, shutting down freeways is nothing new. I'm, I'm sure uh, Evelyn here can speak to that a little more. Um, but this is what's been working for us. This is what's gotten the attention of folks. This is what ultimately creates change. It's, it's not uh, the ultimate decider, but it, it does start a conversation. It does spark um, interest. Um, and this is ultimately the tools that we have, right? Youth, um, aside from being great volunteers, are also people that carry this message for years to come. And so what message do we want to leave behind is ultimately the question we have to ask ourselves as organizers and really show up with the work that we do. Yeah, just like uh, Jonathan said, you know, I, I also work with high school youth um, on the west side of Long Beach at Cabrillo High School. Um, and uh, basically we have a youth program called Kabataan Unite or Youth Unite Filipino Youth Leadership Workshop Series uh, by hosted by uh, Kabataan Alliance, a, youth, a Filipino youth alliance um, all over the nation uh, representing hundreds of uh, Filipino youth clubs and organizations. Um, and some of the things we've done is uh, workshops. So basically they learn how to, to be a leader. They also find out what are the issues that are affecting them. Uh, and then they also create uh, demands. They, they talk about what's, uh, what are the solutions they think they could do in their schools. Because that's, that's some of the issues like, uh, you know, not funding education, but the, the money's been going to militarization um, in this country. So that's, that's some of the, the main uh, demands that the youth have. And these youth come from different high schools. They come from Cabrillo, they come from Poly, they come from Carson High School, uh, uh, even at Millican too. So, you know, we're really creating that space for young people to get together. Um, and I think, you know, us here today, we, you know, we definitely should create more of those spaces where young people can be able to have a voice. So it's not just all like older people, you know, no disrespect, you know what I'm saying? But, but I mean, I'm older too. <laughs> so I mean, but I'm coming at it from, I was, I was a youth as well. I was a youth uh, when I was 15. Now I went through that process and I know how empower, empowering that was for me. And it, it totally changed my life going through these hip hop uh, leadership workshops and activism, you know, learning what was affecting me in my life. And, uh, you know, now I'm here, I changed my life and I'm serving, you know, the, the youth that, uh, you know, that I could relate to growing up, you know, in the hood in Long Beach. So, yeah, that, you know, it, it makes me feel, you know, inspired and, and just, it, it, it's actually what keeps me going uh, up until now to, to organize other young people. Uh, because, you know, it, it's, it's our responsibility to, you know, it's the youth right now, so. Mm -hmm. lean, in, lean into the microphone. Well, I can't really speak on like the the recent. Uh, I I would need to do more research, but yeah, I can't really speak on that on that on those issues. Yeah, uh, if anybody else has other thoughts on it. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's working, but you can come up here. <laughs> or use this one. But like I'm like Trace on stage. Um, I, I, I had a comment. Basically, um, listen to everybody talk. The the main uh, thing that I thought about was basically why do why can't we stop problems before it happens? And what I honestly believe is that everybody's not on the same page. And I think it goes all the way back to the beginning of time. How I feel uh, everything starts with two people. So if you break it down and then you have all these different races, I honestly believe everybody's related. And then when you have one group, which is the human race, and then you have people that break up and divide everybody and say, you're this race, you're this race, you're this race. And with that comes different beliefs. So I honestly think that and also, like when it comes to slavery and things like that, I believe slavery still exists. Like I don't, under, I don't know what people think prison is, but if you're getting paid less than minimum wage and you're getting paid eight cents, a day or whatever it is that's not that's being less than human so that's that's honestly just what i think and then when you were talking about the 60s because i have most of my uh family grew up in um birmingham alabama and mobile alabama 
So I, I do agree with everybody, but I just think that everybody's not on the same page. Same with people not voting. It's, it, you're giving somebody Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. It's kind of like asking, like, which cancer do you want? So it's like either way, you know. So I, I just believe everybody has to be on the same page, but things have been broken up and lied to people about for so long. So people just have to educate themselves. Same thing with presidents. How, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, yeah. it's the same same thing with right. the first president. I was a man in office seven years before him, but you get taught that it was George Washington. So it just it keeps going on and on and on and on and on. So that's that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, you, we have to re, we have to really create our own reality <laughs> because people gonna you know the divide and conquer all this behavior. There's been miseducation everywhere. Miss, I mean, and it was by design. So we have to move, and we, and we can do that. You know, you, you, you have to know who to listen to. <laughs> you have to create uh, voices that, that can go where you want to go. You know, I mean, you can't follow the slave master because the slave master could want slaves. <laughs> and if you, and, and if you, create yourself a slave, you're going to be a slave. You're going to follow that leadership that is making you into this thing that you don't need to be because, you know, you're not in charge of yourself. So we have to be self-promoting. We have to be self-sufficiency, su sufficient people. We have to be, have our own voice listen to our voice, get our knowledge, our information, educate yourself. I mean, anybody gonna educate you but you? <laughs> How do you get educated? You find out what you need to know and define what you want to do and the direction that you wanna go in and educate yourself as to how to get there. And if you, I mean, these are things that you all, everybody have the same equipment. We all have a brain, we have a body, we have needs, we have the same thing that these other people are doing. But we pay more attention to them than we do ourselves. And you can't win doing that. You have to pay attention to you, like they're paying attention to themselves. You have to do the same thing for yourself that they're doing for themselves. Think about your self-interest and the people around you who have the same needs that you have. And communicate with them so that you'll know and you'll get it. And that's what community organizing is all about. You know, it, you, you know, there's common interests. And it's everywhere. But you know, we get hung up on trips. You know, we, get, we listen to the wrong thing. And these people know that. And so they reinforce that. And they develop institutions that perpetuate that. So you build your own institutions that take you in the direction you need to go in. And you already have the ability to do that. But if you listen to the bad people, <laughs> then you're going to do bad things. If you listen to the good and figure out what's good for you, you're going to go in the right direction. So, and that, that's a choice you have. Excuse me, I didn't want to. Yeah, and, and I would just add that the college campus is a really great place to, to try that out and to start your, your activism. Um, if you see that there is a need, fix it, go for it, start a club. That's what I did. I, I realized that women needed a place to talk about their rights and to have open discussions about gender issues. So I started a club and it's grown and it's doing really well and people are getting informed and learning how to be activists. And so this is the place to do it. Um, you have plenty of support. Administration loves to see students take the lead. So go for it. There's nothing holding you back. You have all the support that you need. Just do it. Don't be scared. Yeah. <laughs>